Monterey Public Library welcomes you to the Community Impact Panel. Today's program is part of Book to Action 2021, a grant funded program of the California Library Association, supported in whole or in part by the US Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act administered in California by the state librarian. Book to Action initiatives tackle important issues in the community and encourage reading, community discussion, and action, focusing on this year's themes of equity, health, and sustainability. Across California, there are 110 participating library locations, 36 unique book to action initiatives, and 35 California library jurisdictions. Monterey Public Library selected CAST, The Origins of Our Discontents, by Pulitzer Prize winning author Isabel Wilkerson for this summer's Book to Action and Adult Summer Reading Program. We want to provide a big thanks to the Community Foundation for Monterey County, John A. Powell, the Gathering and Belonging Institute, Tyler Williamson, the Monterey County Weekly, of course, the California Center for the Book, and the many ally organizations who signed on to participate and share this program with their staff, members, and network. My sincere appreciation and gratitude for the steadfast commitment and many contributions of the Book to Action Steering Committee who made this program possible, Elaine Gehrman, Laura Lee Alexander, JT Mason, and Leslie Simon. And now it is my pleasure and honor to welcome and introduce Laurel Lee Alexander, who will be facilitating today's program. Laurel Lee Alexander has served as Vice President of Community Impact for the Community Foundation for Monterey County since 2014, where she leads competitive grant making, program initiatives, and community engagement, and the Foundation Center for Nonprofit Excellence. She has more than 20 years of experience in philanthropy, nonprofit fund development, and corporate marketing, and is committed to furthering best practices and grant making in the field of philanthropy. Laurel has also worked as director of philanthropy at the Monterey Peninsula Foundation, host of the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am, and held positions at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, United Way, the Walt Disney Company, and the Colgate Palmolive Company. Laurel holds degrees from UCLA and the Thunderbird School of Global Management and has studied and worked in the UK, Norway, and Hong Kong. Her community volunteer experience includes Junior League of Monterey County, Literacy Campaign for Monterey County, Girls Inc., Rebuilding Together, and Catholic Charities. She has served on numerous local and national nonprofit boards and is the secretary of the Community Foundation's National Standards Board and immediate past president of the Association of Junior Leagues International. Laurel, thank you so much for your leadership and facilitating today's program. Thank you for that kind introduction, Francesca. I can barely recognize myself. I think that photo is a few years old. But uh, thank you, I really appreciate the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I am honored to be here today as part of the Monterey Public Library's Book to Action program. Today's panel is another opportunity to come together, to learn from each other, and hear from community organizations. The format of today's panel is, one, an informal book discussion, two, a panel of representatives from local organizations doing racial equity, equity work and providing resources in Monterey County, three, question and answer session, which I hope you will all participate in, and then finally, a wrap up. I'd like to introduce Elaine Gehrman, who has been leading the book discussions of CAST for us through the Book to Action program. She will facilitate a book discussion until 2.25. So Elaine, you're up. Thank you so much, Laurel, and thanks to everyone for being here. Um, it's really been a great experience, this Book to Action project, working with Francesca in the library and JT and Leslie and Laurel. And um, yes, so thrilled that we've been discussing this wonderful book cast. And um, let's see. So a little bit about the book. I hope many of you have read it. If you haven't, I certainly encourage you to. And the library still has many copies, I believe, in circulation, as well as digital copies you can get. So CAST reveals the many ways race is a social construct. 
and invites us to discover the inner workings of an American hierarchy that goes far beyond the confines of race, class, or gender. A book steeped in empathy and insight, Cast explores through layered analysis and stories of real people, the structure of an unspoken system of human ranking and reveals how our lives are still restricted by what divided us centuries ago. We broke the book up over five sessions. We had five Tuesday sessions and five Saturday sessions, each reading the, the same kind of 100 pages um, each week. And we had a number of different participants and very lively and deep and informative and insightful and emotional discussions. Um, and so we're gonna invite uh, a few folks from the book discussion to share. We have one, um, uh, Matt wasn't able to be here, but he did send a comment for us. So he said, cast changed the way I view race in America. It explains more of the phenomena than any other approach and offers a framework for moving forward without putting a guilt trip on anyone. Other folks, so do we got um, this? JT, are you? Sorry. <laughs> Would you want to talk? Okay, sorry. Uh, I should get in? Sure. What, one of the things I, what uh, you read, um, Elaine made me think about it. Um, so often when you start doing work um, on any kind of the oppressions, it's easy, at least it was for me, I got in growing up uh, gay rights and women's rights and really focus on that and, and just didn't really think about that over there. I knew it was not good, but I was you know, fighting for my own life and seeing things through my own lens. And I think so often that's how we're set up with each other around any kind of marginalized group. We're set up by the people in charge to sort of fight for the little scraps, but also we don't make the conversations or we have this higher hierarchy of, well, mine's, my issue's worse because of this and this, and I can't be that because I'm gay. And instead of looking at the fact that there's a whole system in place, and like she says so beautifully in the book, unless you work really hard to look at all the different systems and how your own life is interwoven in that and plays into that, it's hard to break free. And when we break free and we build the coalitions, which I think CAST really helps us do, is when we get the power uh, to work together to celebrate one another. And that's how we're going to bring this crazy white supremacy hopefully to its knees someday. I mean, I think we're getting smarter and better at forming those coalitions. And I think the book is excellent at starting those conversations. Super, thank you, JT. Thank yes. you. Yeah, I agree. Mabel, would you like to share a little bit about your experience? You are a very faithful attender and great discusser and would love to hear, have you share a little of your perspective with us. Um, several things. I, uh, the book impacted me in several ways. I think that both her books should be required reading in American history courses somewhere along the line. They must be. People need to be informed. Um, I, I am also really glad the library put this project on and also to see that my tax dollars are being used for something constructive and positive. I hope that I, you know, I also thought a lot about the chalice and the blade by Rihanna Eisler. She talks a lot there about domination, the domination system, the, the domination model. And even though her chalice and the blade is mostly um, in terms of gender inequality, I think that inequality is inequality. You can apply it to anything. And the dominator uh, model really is, is in this book that we just read. Um, Wilkerson explains it so thoroughly. Um, I am glad to have a tool in my hands that I can use that is her book because the dialogue sometimes is hard when you don't know how to communicate and when you don't know what the other person is thinking. So uh, I am immensely grateful to have caught this, this uh, program and to have been able to participate. Um, 
what am I doing about it? What I'm, what I'm doing about it is telling everybody to read this book. I think people are afraid of what they don't know. And uh, so what we need to do is get to know each other. And, and that will be the end of, of fear. Sorry, I have a bug there. Um, I, well, I suppose I can leave the rest for later. All right. All right. Thank you so much. And I think you also said you were in another book group that you were going to um, recommend this book to read. Is that right? So I always that, think that's that is that is that is correct. I recommend I suggested and we're book, we're going to read this book in September, October. And I'm also telling everybody to read this book. And I, I, I think that even, you know, I agree with what Matt said and JT, of course. Um, and and I, should, I want to bring up this this issue again that of the guilt um, we're not responsible or we didn't do it but uh, we're not we shouldn't feel guilty but we are responsible to change the way things are it's our responsibility i don't think we can wash our hands on that yeah yeah great thank you i think that was sort of a point that came up in the discussions over and over and also that she makes throughout the book you know, she really, she uses the metaphor, Isabel Wilkerson uses the metaphor of an old house. And if you get in, if you inherit or buy or somehow living in an old house, you inherit the problems with it, you know, and they don't fix themselves. And it isn't necessarily, you didn't necessarily cause those problems, but if you don't do something about it and, or if you contribute to the continued deterioration of the house, that is on you kind of. So I was, it was a very helpful metaphor, I thought. So how about Sherry, would you like to share a little about your experience with the book and the book discussions? Because I'm coming from, uh, you know, a period when we, we had so much activity during my younger years, my teen years, trying to support civil rights and sit-ins and, and all these different things that I participated in at the time, I've been very discouraged by what happened. And so I've revisited what's going on through this book cast and a few other books. And I think what struck me in this that's new to me, that's helpful to me is that racism is just a function of this much bigger system. And that helps me to understand why it's so difficult to do something about it. Um, and the other thing is I'm, I'm always wanting to know, well, what can I do? How can I help? How can I um, make sure that, that I'm doing something about this and not just perpetuating the system? What was helpful to me in her book is giving the concrete examples of the things that had happened to her. And I talked about this a little bit last week in that because she talked about that, I was able in my mind to think, what would I do in that situation that wouldn't make the situation worse for her or a person in that situation, but that would actually be helpful. And so I went back to some of my things that I've learned about uh, verbal judo, which is just to take a person out of the situation to help rather than to confront somebody. And they both have the same end result of helping that situation, supporting that person and ending the situation. But other things too, it made me think about what would I do? How could I help? Um, and it's been a an ongoing thing just with my family members to know what to do and what to say. It's very troubling when I'm confronted with these things and the peer pressure is so intense. And then the, the, the not being able to get through to them um, with the logical talks. And so her discussions of stories and, you know, you, you discuss getting to know each other, but how do, are they trying to get to know us? That's what's difficult for me. And so I would have been interested with John Powell to ask him some questions about how he's been effective in the community, how he's actually reaching people and how we're affecting change. So I'm thinking more along those lines now about how to actually support people who are making sure the changes happen. So it's, there's been a lot for me in this book. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. Yeah. And we're going to hear in a few minutes, we're going to hear from some people in the community that are trying to make change. But I, yeah, and I really like, again, you lifted up. She does talk so much about the systemic nature of caste, how all, I mean, the eight pillars that are all holding up this structure that places us in these various places. And she also really does emphasize some of our individual agency, how we really can make a difference. We don't necessarily have to accept the place that we're put into or that other people are put into. And so it's, I like it's both and. It isn't just an individual thing, but it also isn't just this big amorphous thing that we can't do anything to affect that it's sort of both and, so great. All right, how about some other folks that participated, read, read the book and were in, attended a discussion? Any other thoughts you'd like to share? You raise your hand either electronically or turn on your video and wave at me. I saw Anita, I saw Anita or Janet, I know you were here or I'm trying to see a couple of folks. Cindy, you were here, any? I'll speak. Go ahead, um, Anita. I'm kind of eating my, my lunch, but um, <laughs> so, for me, this was this. I'll start out with a very bold statement. I think everybody living in the United States should read this book. I am obsessed with this book. And for me personally, one of the things it gave me was a framework that helped me understand at a deeper level how impenetrable this caste system is, how, how it, is, it, it is fixed, and we can do things to improve the situation but it is one big powerful system that um, we all have to work together to dismantle and it won't be easy. And it's systemic and it's individual and we have got to collaborate on this, absolutely. Thank you for, for, for sponsoring this. It's, it was an, we had some amazing conversations. Terrific, thanks so much, Anita. Other folks? I'm Elsa. Here, I'll try to. Oh, here. thank you. Yes, I read the book, um, I believe in 2020 when it first came out. Um, but to me, it seemed like I couldn't help but to keep thinking about even the year's name, 2020, and clear vision. So to me, this was the way I received it, like a gift from the universe for clear vision. I don't think, I also agree. I don't think any book that I've ever read is as important as this book. And it's the most hopeful book I've ever read too, because, um, you know, know the truth and it shall set you free. When you have a clear vision, it seems like, oh, now I can see how this was constructed. Now we can see how this can be deconstructed. Before we were just also swimming in these waters of brainwashing and confusion. And so, um, yeah, I, I've been completely 100% transformed by this book. And uh, again, you know, any other book, I usually end up feeling I'm going to say more discouraged, but this was so unique in the freedom. I feel like it gave me the empowerment, uh, the joy. Um, and I've been, you know, to, um, you know, echo a few comments. Um, I remember back, I chose to vote for Barack Obama over Hillary Clinton back when they were running for president. And honest to God, I lost so many women friends. They were furious with me. And I just, I like Hillary Clinton. I just believed in Barack Obama more. And I felt like he was the right person at the right moment. Um, but we're so, um, you know, 
taught to just fight for our in-group. So I'm a woman, so I just have to vote for Hillary Clinton over Obama, you know, and all that kind of like, you know, just separation, divide and conquer and, and fighting for your own little group will never, um, again, also somebody uh, talked about the paradigm of dominance and everything. So I, I totally agree with that too, that this, um, you know, the, the basic thing is, do we want to keep perpetuating, um, you know, a social structure where there are winners and losers? And I'm afraid I, I didn't see John Powell's presentation, but I know I've heard some other talks about his idea of creating a world where we all belong. Even the thought of that, even that phrase is just so uplifting to me and something that I dedicate the rest of my life to a world where everybody belongs. So thank you all. Well, I just have, I will say, amen, Elsa. Okay. That was, <laughs> no, really, that was beautifully said. And, and I agree too. I really like what, what, that you lifted up again, how I too found the book very hopeful and not because she sugarcoated the issues. You know, not because she may tried to make the problems less than they are, but because she really did, as you said, she lifted up the point that he, we human beings created this mess. <laughs> we we can we have the power then to change it. And that and that while I know that in my head, sometimes the books I read when you feels like the problems are so great and that the obstacles are so challenging that it was, it, I think she really believes that too. And I, so I, and I felt like she did sort of give us some tools for thinking about it. And as a lot of folks said throughout the discussions, awareness and awareness that you can really hear and take in that doesn't make you put up all your defenses, which so often I think happens, particularly for people in dominant culture groups that sometimes it feels like it's coming at you. I think she has such a way with her stories and metaphors and examples of getting kind of past some of those defenses and really make, make I think raising our awareness and motivating us to really take some action. On that note, we're gonna turn it over back to Laurel and then we're gonna hear from some local organizations that are doing just that in various ways. So again, I just wanna thank everyone who participated and if you ha again, if you haven't read the book, please do share it with your friends, recommend it. Anybody ever wants to talk, I'm, I'd be always, I love this book and I'd be happy to talk about it anytime. So thank you all. And thanks French and the library for sponsoring this. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Elaine, and all of you who shared comments about CAST. Uh, side note, the Community Foundation has a diversity, equity, and inclusion book club. We are reading this book right now. We had our first discussion yesterday. It was very rich. And uh, I share what Elsa said. This is um, probably one of the most powerful, impactful books I've ever read. And I just privately messaged uh, Francesca at the library after your comments, Elsa. And I said, I'm, I'm, um, I'm near tears after hearing Elsa's comments. So anyway, thank you for, for sharing your comments. Next. We are pleased to introduce representatives from these local organizations. Please be patient while I share my screen. Okay. Boy, Zoom has really uh, provided all of us the opportunity to multitask. So hopefully you can all see my screen. We are going to hear from representatives of these organizations. And they're going to share some information with us to coordinate the time for this panel and allow for question and answers later. We've asked each panelist to spend three to five minutes to answer these questions. Number one, briefly share the background and purpose of your work. Number two, what work has your organization been doing in the community? And three, how can community members participate and support your organization. So first we have a representative from the Monterey County branch of the NAACP, Stephen Goings. And I will stop sharing so we can all see each other. And uh, Stephen, I see you. If you would like to share your important information with the attendees, that would be great. Well, thank you for, for, uh, for inviting me. I, um, I, I'm in good company. I have relationships with um, members of every single group, except perhaps the administrative offices. 
Um, do you want me to go through the whole thing at, at once? At once? Okay, very well. Please. Um, okay, so well, the, the, I'm representing. I'm the membership chair of the Monterey County branch in WCP. So I am coming in here with an agenda. Everyone should know that immediately. Uh, um, the NWCP, our branch, Monterey County, was founded in um, 1932, initially um, by members of the Peninsula's first um, historically Black church, um, First Baptist Church of Pacific Grove. Um, nationally, we have over 2,000 units in the U.S. and um, over 2 million members. The original association was founded in direct response um, to the Springfield, Illinois race riots in 1908. And so we were founded in 1909 by an interracial group of 60 activists, only seven of whom were black, uh, the most famous of who um, are probably Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois. And we continue to be an integrated uh, um, organization with a predominantly black membership. The mission of the NWCP is a uh, simple and profound, um, which is simply to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality and rights of all persons and to eliminate uh, race, uh, racial hatred and discrimination. In terms of the question about community work, I, I, I think I should talk both about uh, nationally and, and locally. Um, so nationally, just to give um, people an idea, um, the famous case that ended legal segregation in this in this country, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, well, that was brought and argued and won by NAACP lawyers. Uh, Rosa Parks' famous act of civil disobedience uh, was not a chance occurrence, as uh, lots of people seem to think. Uh, it was a coordinated action that she undertook as the secretary of the Montgomery um, uh, NAACP. Kind of bringing it, us to um, more modern times, uh, it was the NWCP who first sounded the national alarm that is even more alarming now um, regarding voter um, registration suppression that really began in earnest in 2010 as a backlash to uh, electing our first um, black president in 2008. Uh, and our record-breaking uh, voter registration efforts in 2012 overcame those suppression tactics and ensured a second term for the incumbent president. Here locally, um, uh, perhaps we're kind of thinking about Monterey County in WCPF, perhaps our most important work is to respond to discrimination complaints uh, and support credible complaints and apply pressure um, to offending organizations as needed. The work of our branch is done in committees and there is always more work to be done than there are workers. Um, our current active committees are um, Armed Services and Veterans Affairs, Communication Press and Publicity, Criminal Justice, Education, Health, Labor and Industry, uh, Membership, Political Action and Religious Affairs. And I have to scroll, so give me a moment. <clears throat> Um, through our officers and committees, we provide uh, local student scholarships. We meet with nonprofits, business leaders, elected officials, and community members to address local issues and are currently working uh, to support the establishment of a prison branch um, of the NWCP in Soledad. As far as um, ways to support and participate with us, uh, and I'll, I'll put um, some links in the chat, but all of our units across the nation are run by volunteers and funded by membership dues, which are split between the national organization and the local unit. So even if those who are here with us today, even if you have absolutely no time on your schedule, uh, you should consider purchasing a $30 annual membership to help fund our, impersonal, our important work both on the national and the local level. And um, so um, you would just simply go to the membership link, monterey.nwcp.org slash membership and apply online. Um, under affiliation, you want to affiliate with our branch, 1049 Monterey branch and um, referred by Stephen Goings um, or any other one person that you know. Um, we are having a membership drive, so um, they will really appreciate a contest. So they'll really appreciate your um, naming someone there. And then finally, simply pur purchasing an annual or life membership is helpful 
Uh, but for deeper involvement, just simply attend our, our monthly uh, meetings, which are held on the fourth Thursday of the month at seven, or join an active committee. Our greatest need at the moment is a new office in which to hold our meetings. So we definitely appreciate any support or leads that you have. Um, we'll be celebrating our 90th um, anniversary on February 26th. Um, so please come to, our, um, to, to that event. Um, and then on a national level, I think the primary support that we need um, is for people to, um, to support the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. So we should be sending out a petition in the next few days. Um, and I think that's, 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 uh, that's about it. Um, so uh, join your local NWCP. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephen. And I took note that uh, anyone who joins should mention his name. Maybe he'll get a special praise from, from the local chapter. So that's great. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Rosemary Soto from the Monterey County Administrative Office. And Rosemary, if you need me to move on to someone else, that's fine. But if you are ready, then please unmute and begin talking. Thank you, Laura Lee. Uh, Laura, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here with you today. This is such an important topic, not just because of the current political climate or that of the last administration or what is going on uh, across the country and in, in the world um, right now. Uh, it, this is an issue um, that has been with us um, since the founding of this nation um, and even before that, right? And so I, I really am, am so grateful for these conversations, you know, props to the city of Monterey for really, you know, putting this out and, 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 and working and collaborating with all of these organizations with the Community Foundation. And I'm, I'm honored to be in the presence of such great people from, you know, just remarkable organizations. And, um, I'm Rosemary Soto. I come from Salinas, California. I'm a native here to, to my community in Salinas. I was born and raised and I am also very blessed. I feel very fortunate to be able to do work that is of my, um, I feel it's like my life's calling. Like it's, 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 you know how when you have your dream job where you get to do what you just love to do and it doesn't feel like a job at all you know it does it there's that whole cliche and it's so true because um you know i am tasked with identifying ways in which to eradicate racism from a systemic perspective i work for the county of monterey and i work in the county administrative office um what i was initially hired was for a role that really taps into my professional experience in violence prevention and intervention. And coming from that perspective, the reality is just as it is with many of the social, uh, complex social issues in our communities that we are charged to address in local government, um, you know, they're, it's, they're compounded issues and there are root causes and many of them point back to systemic and institutional racism, the inequities, right? Um, nobody grows up uh, wanting to be engaged in, in any violent type of you know, situation, whether it be as a victim or perpetrator. Um, young people don't uh, aspire to become uh, involved in the ju justice system. And so, but if you look at how is our system it working together to address and, and create opportunities for youth to succeed and, and thrive and, and families and communities to thrive. There's so many things, right? So with that, from that perspective, um, I, I was also fortunate to have the opportunity and the support of our board of supervisors, the support of my direct superiors to uh, bring into the County of Monterey an initiative that is called Governing for Racial Equity. And it was, it's very explicit. It is very intentional. We are looking at what are those systemic and institutional uh, situations, policies, practices. A lot of them are just practices. It's not even a law or a policy. We're really just in, in, the, in, the, in the routine of doing business how we do uh, without really paying attention or looking at what are those unintentional consequences. And one of the things that we are doing within our, our county system, we, we've, we've been at this for a number of years. 
Um, and we began with just a, a huge learning experience and a learning process because this work um, is, is that of, of transformation. It's transformational work. So you've got to really educate and help people come on to uh, be on your page with understanding what racism is. There is a, there's a lot going on where some folks, um, their, their roles and their jobs within the county are very policy driven. So it's like, I, you know, if I'm going to enforce the law, it's just the law. I don't see race. I don't take that into consideration. If I'm going to build housing, I'm just building houses. I'm not looking at you know, race and, and ethnicity or the impact of that. So there's there's different types of, you know, roles, right? But the reality is that everywhere in every department of our county and every aspect of our work in local government, there are opportunities to assess for racial equity or racial inequities because everything is woven together. There's intersectionality in so many of, of our works and we really need to take a closer look at that. So in, in, in the learning process, we have also um, developed a, a training that is mandated now for all of our county employees. We're more than 5,400 employees. Uh, with an introduction to what is racial equity. And within there, you know, we, we discuss a lot of what is um, uh, talked about in the book, you know, that there is what is systemic uh, racism and institutional racism. Um, we, we all may come become familiar with what is individual racism and internalized racism. But what we are aiming to do and being intentional about is not the pointing fingers, not, pace, not placing blame, not looking at it from a personal perspective, but look in and looking at it from a systemic perspective and, and pointing to the fact that, you know, racism didn't start with you and I in the room, you know, it started way before us. And so how do we, someone said earlier, I forgot who it was that said it, but I did, um, hear it and and it really resonates is that you know just because we were not a part of the, those who initiated or perpetuate this 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 um this issue of racism it is our responsibility to address it it is our responsibility to stand up and do something about it and speak against it and and figure out what are the ways in which our role in this life in this world how are we making this a better place for our, for not just for me and you, but for our communities, for everybody who lives here, um, and and that's a big part of what we do. And and I'm 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 just super, you know, glad and and I feel proud of our of our county. We're not perfect, you know. Local government is not perfect. I consider myself a bureau activist, you know, because I'm an activist at heart. And you know, working in a bureaucracy, I'm telling you, it's not for the faint of heart. So it's it's challenging. But I really feel that um, there's hope. There's hope for for our local governments to really embrace this work. And um, and I, I've had the opportunity to partner up with the city of Salinas, who also has a GRE team within um, within their city. And, um, and you know the cities of. Uh, Del Rio, city of Seaside, and now city of Monterey. And people, local government is, is, is really partaking and in getting involved, city of Pacific Grove as well, I forgot to mention. And um, because together, I think we can achieve um, the eradication of racism. You know, it may not happen in my lifetime completely, but I'm certainly going to do my part and be involved at this level. Um, we also have the opportunity to engage community in different ways. I mentioned that one aspect of my role of my job there is to um, work with the with the, um, the initiative to address violence prevention, violence intervention. Right. So there's plenty of opportunities to get involved. There are organizations um, across the county that that um, that are working together to address that, and and also from a roots cause perspective. We also um have uh oh you'll see here i forget to change my background i'm you know one of my other assignments is redistricting redistricting monterey county uh this you know redistricting is happening everywhere and prior to this one of my assignments was the 2020 census so a county-wide effort many community organizations were engaged in that and it's so interesting how um racial equity is intersected in, in each of these particular um, uh, assignments that I have been so 
uh, that the honor has been bestowed upon me to carry on. And here in redistricting is one way in which you can get involved because we definitely need to have the voice of our community members when we look at what this process turns out to be. Um, we, we know about gerrymandering, racial and, and, and partisan gerrymandering. Those are a couple of things that really are gonna affect our right to vote you know, uh, further on for the next 10 years. And so um, that's a little bit about what I do. Um, the Governing for Racial Equity Initiative is one that I also mentioned is uh, very specific in looking at how our, do our policies have these uh, unintended consequences that are further marginalizing communities of color, low income poor communities of color as well throughout Monterey County. Um, and I can give you, I think I'm just at about time, but I can just you know give you a very quick example of what that looks like for us. One um, is we, you know, we worked really closely with our department at that time was known as a resource management agency and now is in public works. Um, they develop a, a, a plan for uh, projects under the capital improvement plan that needs to be funded every year. Um, it, making it short, uh, there's a list of projects that each department puts together that do not have a funding a, a source attached to it. And there's a prioritization process that that department goes through that makes a recommendation to the board in terms of what they should fund. We now have a racial equity assessment tool that looks at that from a racial equity lens and we reprioritize that list by identifying which of those capital improvement projects are gonna affect communities of color most. Asking very you know, intentional questions and that reprioritized list gets presented to the Board of Supervisors. So now the board is making a more informed decision when they are looking at how to fund and grant, grant county dollars into that. So that's just one very brief example. If you are interested in engaging and learning more and getting involved um, from a community perspective, um, I am absolutely um, happy to engage with you and connect with you on a one-on-one -on -one level um, or with your organization if, if that's uh, a better fit. And I'll put my contact information in the chat. And um, I'm sorry, I could keep going, but I know I have timed, so thank you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. That's the first time I've heard you describe yourself as a bureaucrat, and I'm going to remember that. Uh, that's a great term. I did put a link in the chat. It is a website that the Monterey County put together uh, of a timeline of the experience of racial groups in Monterey County. I hope you all take a look at it. So thank you so much, Rosemary. Uh, next up is a representative from the National Coalition Building Institute, otherwise known as NCBI. I'm happy to introduce Feroz Karai. So hey everyone, I'm Feroz Karai I'm here uh, representing NCBI. Um, I've had the privilege of being with NCBI um, for about a year now and serving on the board uh, since April. Um, you know, myself personally, I'm fairly new to the county. I've lived in the county about five years, uh, moved here after 20 years in Brooklyn um, and moved uh, to um, basically first generation immigrant from India. Um, so coming into kind of a new, um, a new county, raising a family here um, and, um, you know, kind of, uh, I really have been interested in a long time and just kind of uh, being involved with organizations like NCBI. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so NCBI Monterey County um, was founded in the early 90s as a community chapter of the National Coalition Building Institute, uh, which uh, NCBI uh, International, which has been around since the mid 80s. Um, so we're fortunate to be a, a local organization with a national and international network of NCBI trainers and mentors to pull from. Um, and I think, you know, we, we have a fairly long history of respect and trust within the community. Um, so we work and collaborate with public and private organizations uh, to nurture leadership for social justice and create opportunities for healing from the impact of oppression. 
Um, and we provide training and education within schools and a larger community um, with the goal of uh, reducing prejudice, um, increasing understanding, and promoting uh, acceptance and equity. Um, our purpose is really right there in the name, uh, coalition building. Um, so ultimately what we aim to do is bring people together across group division lines, including race, uh, sexual orientation, religion, age, um, people with disabilities and class. Um, we are nonpartisan, um, against oppression, not attacking individuals. Um, we are, we consider ourselves bridge and coalition builders. Um, and as far as like kind of direct work within the community, we have three general areas that we really focus in on. Uh, one is our community conversations, and these are free educational workshops um, with subject matter experts within our network um, that dive deep into a specific topic. In uh, 2020 and 21, um, so far we've had ones on racism, uh, conflict resolution, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. Um, and we uh, had the privilege of uh, sponsoring and hosting a pilot one put together by a, um, a gentleman named uh, Jago Juarez um, for the history of racism in Monterey County, which is now being kind of further developed into potentially something a little bigger because, uh, well, you know, the, there's a lot to cover there. Um, uh, another area uh, that we work in is in putting together programs and workshops for schools and youth. Um, you know, such as our Generation Diversity School Youth Program. And that focuses in on um, training and mentoring student leaders who play crucial, um, pivotal roles in the prevention of discrimination, um, violence and mistreatment that arises within um, their schools and communities, really our schools and communities. Um, and then we extend this training, the trainers program into opportunities for these students to then in turn kind of work with and essentially train their peers. So middle school students will help lead, um, you know, uh, welcome to diversity workshops and then high school students that have been through it already will mentor them. Um, so the hope is to really kind of create um, this uh, intergenerational um, knowledge um, and uh, ethos that kind of passes on um, from, uh, from class to class. Um, so we've done this fairly recently within MPUSD, uh, York and San Carlos schools. Um, and then the last area that we uh, work in is in contract work for organizations and workplaces. Uh, so we hold workshops and develop programs in the spirit of coalition building and helping to form leadership within these organizations as well. Um, we do this with nonprofits, corporations, uh, and law enforcement or government bodies as well. Um, and I don't know for sure if I can name specific ones, so I won't. <laughs> um, and as far as um, support, you know, um, community members participating or supporting NCBI. Um, so first, we're a nonprofit, right? And much of the funding for our work comes from donations. So donating is incredibly vital for us. Um, and it's pretty easy to do so by visiting our website uh, at ncbimonterey.org and clicking on the donate button. Um, the other ways are really to attend our community conversations, um, which I mentioned before, um, where kind of in addition to the educational benefits, you get to meet like-minded people within the county. Um, you know, and the best way to learn about those is also while on our website at ncbimonterey.org to sign up for our newsletters, because we always send multiple um, newsletters about, you know, what um, the activities that we're doing within the community. And if you're interested in volunteering, we always welcome volunteers. Um, you can reach out to our chapter administrator. Uh, his name is Michael Fredrickson, and his contact info is on the website. And I believe, I may be wrong, but also provided in a packet that you may receive at the end of uh, this discussion. But I can also put it in the chat um, uh, if you'd like the info. Um, and then, you know, probably the last and maybe the most important thing is just being a part of discussions and groups like these, um, educating ourselves uh, and others, being conscious allies and building awareness. Um, they're all helpful, right? Not only to us as NCBI, but everyone, 
um, that uh, within the community, uh, everyone are trying to support as well. So, you know, thank you for all that. And um, that's that. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Feroz. And I noticed that Stephen has posted a lot of links for your organization in the chat. So I like that uh, tag teaming there. Thanks thank so much. <laughs> that's great. Our next speaker is representing Whites for Racial Equity. Happy to introduce JT Mason. Hi, thanks, Laurel. Um, our organization started about six years ago and it came about um, during a horrendous time from Trayvon Martin on to all the people who were shot and killed every 26 hours. Um, then when the massacre happened at the church. Um, there was a rally in Seaside and I remember Angelus came up to me and said, you, because we were meeting at too many rallies and too many memorials and vigils and said, you really need to start working with your people. We need to get much more white people involved in this anti-racism work uh, to stop this. And that resonated with me and the work that she had done along with Caroline Haskell with um, their wonderful book, um, Steve just went right out of my mind. I'm sorry. Uh, Stephen, could you put Shared that on? destiny. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and also uh, with Sandra Bland, that was for me a person when she was killed, that was a personal uh, charge for me to start really investing my whole self into this. And so a group of us got together. We're sort of a loosely knit group in that we're done by a steering committee we have people come to various things. And I'll tell you about that in just a second. But our, we're not the final end that we want people to be here. We want white people to come, to awaken to the horrors that are going on, to learn the skills how to be anti-racist, to realize that racism is more than just not telling a bad joke or looking the other way, but all those systems that are purposely put together and layered to have this brutal, brutal effect on people of color. As a white person, it is so, it's so simple not to look um, because when you start, you feel the pain, you feel the shame, you feel all these things, you don't know what to do. So oh, don't look again. And just you assume the privileges and the uh, rights that you have, everybody has, or you earned them, or you buy into whatever kind of narrative was told to you. And it takes waking white people up, and I speak as one, to really look how this was all set in place and how well I may not think I am perpetuating it, how my inaction is, how my not saying something is. Every time I'm not doing something to try to fight that, I'm help perpetuating systemic racism. And I think basically we all want equality for everyone at least I hope so, that we're good at heart, that we don't see it as a zero sum game, but that we lift each other up. So Whites for Racial Equity does several things uh, each month. We've had book discussions or movie discussions, choosing books like Cast, uh, another one I would highly recommend. So you want to talk about race. It's Ijeoma Alua's book. And it is beautifully written in, this is, sort of what you're hearing in the media. This is really probably what's going on and this is what you can do. It's a very, almost like a primer that makes it so simple to go out and do some work. And that was one of our, our books that we did. we did. So we have book discussions, we have movie discussions, we have a fantastic website and I wanna thank Anita Crawley for putting that together. It, you can go and find out just about anything uh, to do with race, racism, oppression, uh, there are links to courses you can take online. Um, she reposts the e-blast that I do. The e-blast is a once a week um, email that goes out to people. We have over 500 in our mailing list and then it gets repeated as people pass it on and I put it on our Facebook page that talks about the various things happening in our community as well now because of COVID and Zoom the whole world has opened up to us and there are so many important dialogues, webinars, groups that are doing important work. And this is a way once a week that we highlight those. Um, we put, also put in our Facebook page that's become exceedingly active. I don't know how many people we have, but it's, it's really grown. It's been very exciting to see the connections that people are making. I think we really wanna to talk to one another. Um, 
and yet there's still that awkwardness. And so one of the most important things we do is once a month, it's the second Saturday, we have something I guess a lot of people would call an affinity group or a caucus group. It's the only thing that we do that's specifically aimed at white people. It's a place to come and to do this work so that we're not, so we, we learn because, um, you know, we may have good intentions, but even with our good intentions, we can still do tremendous, horrible impacts um, with not knowing. So we come together and so often we'll have a speaker or a subject, we're gonna do reparations next, how we can get involved in that. Um, we've done a lot of co-sponsoring with uh, the Village Project, with NCBI, NAACP. Uh, any money we raise goes to a, a, another group that's um, led by people of color. We don't take money in for ours. Um, but at these meetings, it's a chance for people to come in and go, I don't know how to do this. Um, I don't know how to have this conversation or my uncle who I adore says this and how do I push back in a way that actually brings him in? Because it's very simple to get out there and go, um, you know, kind of thing. And, and that will just push people away. So we're learning tools and we're working with each other to figure out how to get people to awaken and see that their own humanity is tied up in all of this and that we need to work um, together and we have to unlearn a lot of stuff that we have been taught. So that's a, a big thing that we do on the second Saturday. We also have, like I said, we're not an end, end game. We have a lot of people now who are involved with the NAACP or working for the Village Project is to give people the tools and the springboard to go out and do the important work. One of the things we, we really want our members to do is to leverage any privilege that they see they have. And one thing we did several times with people in the court system, um, there were a couple of cases that a lot of us followed and we would go over to court before COVID and we would be there. And just our presence, a lot of them look like me, the older white people sitting in the courtroom, being interested, supporting the defendant um, or, or the plaintiff in one of these cases, it somehow made a, uh, an impact. I don't think it should, but it did. And we kept hearing it did. And so we kept showing up and we were told by bailiffs and other people that it's important. And that's that community lifting up and changing the narrative of things that people are having to face all the time. So that if you're talking about how to support the work we do, take the conversations where you go, open the racial lens to where you go, uh, get whatever courage or, or come and play with us with the skills so we can sort of say, well, you, did you try that? Did you try this? Um, read the books with us because it's, it is amazing what, what we were taught and what really happened. And there's something so freeing when you start learning what really has gone on that you probably felt, especially as a kid early on, you knew things weren't fair, you saw things wrong, but you kind of were um, put in a way that you don't look at it and then you didn't know what to do about it. When you start learning about it and you start doing things, um, it is so freeing and I, it's, a, it's hopeful because at least you're out there trying. The people on the side who are just so, I don't know what to do with this so big, they're not helping anybody. You gotta get out there and work. And when you work with the kind of people like you're seeing on this web, side are the same kind of people that come to our meetings and NAACP. You're working with comrades to make a world better for all of us. And that's a wonderful thing. So we, we do all this work and we do our best to get people to take it into action, to write letters, to go to the city council, to the school boards, whatever it might be, to be very present and to help uplift the people of color. Um, and I have other people here from WRE, so if I'm leaving something out, please feel free to say it. We have the website, the email, the monthly meetings. Um, yeah, I think we're just really looking at things differently. And I hope we're learning to be really good allies, trustworthy allies. I think we are. Again, we've been going for six years. We work with building healthy communities. Um, we we'll just do our best to partner and uh, be there and, and leverage whatever we have. And uh, if you would like to get the e-blast sent to your email, uh, just send us in the, Anita, if you could write in 
the website and then just click on there and we can add you to the eBlast. And if you're an organization or you're doing something, send it to me because I love publicizing. I think information is power. So thank you. Thank you so much, JT. We're now going to hear from Kathy Biala, who is representing the Coalition for Asian Justice. Kathy. Thank you, Laura. Um, the Coalition for Asian Justice, or CAJ, is a brand new activist group that was created to protest the rise in racism against and attacks on members of the Asian community and Pacific Islander communities. The group initially co coalesced from among those who spoke at the Stop AAPI hate rally in April of this year, many of you may have attended, that occurred on the windows on the bay and featured speakers as Congressman Jimmy Panetta and Monterey Council member Tyler Williamson. We have only just had our first in-person meeting, although there has been plenty of online discussions. The agreed upon vision of the Coalition for Asian Justice is to achieve racial justice for all Asians residing in the US, which expressly includes immigrants, by standing in solidarity with all marginalized groups to eradicate structural racism and oppression and to enact concrete changes towards justice through education, support networks, local activism, a big focus for us, and advocacy. Um, um, among our esteemed members, we have presidents of Asian American civic organizations, professors and lecturers on language and global studies, nonprofits and private corporate leaders, both current and retired statuses, we have community activist volunteers, two elected officials, and our members represent a whole range of varied backgrounds from Chinese, Vietnamese, Filipino, South Asian, Thai, Caucasian, Taiwanese, and Japanese. And we are still wanting to expand this representation further. For those wanting more information on membership um, to the Coalition for Asian Justice, please contact Michael Ibsen at 831-887-8082. Um, I just posted uh, the um, information for his email address, or you can contact me, Kathy Biala, at 831-242-0023. And again, I posted um, the email address. We do not have as yet a website, so you won't currently find us online, but being a startup, this is a unique opportunity to join our high powered group to shape our direction and implement high impact actions. So I hope you'll join us. And Laurel, I know that we seem to be um, uh, at a, a deadline at three o'clock, but may I, may I continue? Yes, please do so. Okay. Um, and as I'm listening to all these speakers, I just wanted to make an individual comment that's linked to the, um, the vision of the CAJ. And now that I'm an elected official, I'm now privy to the system of power from the inside. And I have new perspectives on how to change systems. If we want to change systemic racism, I think we need to use different interventions as opposed to the personal and interpersonal strategies that most of us are familiar with. I hope in our uh, CAJ group that we'll begin to explore these systemic strategies and as a group implement some new actions that will make a difference on the systems that maintain the status quo. If we change systemic racism, we may see more dramatic advances in a shorter amount of time that's yet to be seen. This is my hope for our group objectives. I appreciate Rosemary Soto's comments. She was very focused on systemic strategies to target systemic racism. And I also um, I very much appreciate JT Mason's comments of what she considers leveraging privilege. I had not heard of that term before, but I think it can be especially helpful in our systemic interventions. I'm so glad to learn so much from all of you and I appreciate having this forum today. So thank you very much. Back to you, Laurel. Thank you so much, Kathy. 
Uh, so we are going to move on. Our next uh, panelist is Elaine Gehrman, who you met this uh, already. She's representing the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Monterey Peninsula. Elaine. Thanks so much. Um, I'll be brief and I just want to be clear. I'm not trying to recruit people to our congregation, though, of course, everyone is welcome. But I really just wanted to lift up. I think some of the work we're doing in our congregation is work that a lot of other not nonprofits and organizations, whether religious or not, are kind of struggling with and working with both those individual and systemic issues. So um, the Unitarian Universalist Church, the Monterey Peninsula is a liberal progressive congregation and we're working on many issues of social justice. That's really something we value highly. Um, we're working also on equity and really trying to focus on inclusion. Um, each month we support a local organization through our shared offering program which is a great opportunity to both um, financially support and leverage some of our privilege to these local organizations doing great work and also raise awareness of our own members. And so I, if, you, if whatever groups you're associated with might be able to do a similar thing, I'd encourage you to consider that. Um, we also uh, are very active in a, supporting a number of the local uh, programs uh, to support the homeless. We also host the Whites for Racial Equity meetings generally when we are able to meet in person. They have been meeting just fine on Zoom, but again, we've been very glad to do that. And we co-host the monthly anti-racism book and film discussions, which I've been very involved in over the last five years and love that. Every first Tuesday of every month, and we have read some amazing books and watched some amazing films and had really super discussions. Um, and I just wanted to share one initiative that our congregation recently started was to um, form a BIPOC or a Black Indigenous People of Color caucus group at our church, which provides an opportunity for Black Indigenous People of Color to discuss and support one another kind of outside of the white gaze, perhaps to share some um, uh, unfortunate microaggressions they might have experienced or sometimes when our um, congregational culture ends up um, unfortunately being reinforced as sort of more white culture, which is really not what we're going for, but sometimes um, white people being socialized as we are, we sometimes tend to reproduce some of that without um, necessarily meaning to. So anyway, so I would also recommend if your organization doesn't have such a thing um, to consider that kind of a BIPOC caucus group. As JT said, um, and, you know, whites for racial equity is sort of a has this white caucus group that meets once a month on Saturdays, but some organizations really, the benefit from having that caucus group. And I know NCBI also does a lot with caucusing and really does see that advantage and sort of dividing up kind of by identities and then coming back together um, and discussing what was discussed within those groups. But again, I think it's, I think it could be really important in churches and any other sort of nonprofit or even, you know, governmental or other systems. So, all right, that was my time. But again, I also just say, we'd love to be in conversation with other community organizations, religious or not, that are working on dismantling white supremacy culture in your organization. Again, it's a cha it's challenging work, but we think we can learn from one another and we're always open to new ideas. And again, just so grateful for all of you and all the terrific work you're doing. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Elaine. So I'm going to share my screen, bear with me. So as you can see, I am the last panelist so I'm going to move ahead and share some resources. Okay, hopefully you can see this. So what I'm doing is I'm sharing the website of the Community Foundation and where to go to learn about some resources on behalf of the Center for Nonprofit Excellence. Our director, Susie Polnazic, could not be here today. She is actually on vacation, darn her. So I am representing her and the Center for Nonprofit Excellence. We call it the CNE. It works with nonprofit staff, board, and volunteers to think strategically and function more effectively. In addition to workshops, trainings, and learning opportunities, we also have, okay, bear with me, I'm trying to multitask here, uh, a resource page. It's a curated list of resources around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what you're doing is you're seeing exactly where to go when you go on the, on the website. Uh, one of the resources is a free bystander intervention training offered by Hollaback, which is a nonprofit working to end harassment. 
Uh, this is a page from the website and that little yellow arrow is showing exactly the link to the bystander intervention training. I participated in Hollaback's bystander intervention to stop anti-Asian American harassment trainings in May. It was very powerful. I highly recommend this, their series of trainings. They have different focuses for their trainings. Hollaback recently reported that since March, over 126,000 people have completed their trainings. That's a 738% increase from the prior three months. So it's clear that people want to take action against harassment. So I hope you'll visit our website and perhaps Hollaback's website to learn more. So bear with me while I stop sharing. Uh, so thanks to all of our panelists. I learned a lot and I'm so appreciative of the time you spent with us. It's now time for a question and answer session. If you have a question for any of our panelists, either please come off camera and wave or raise your Zoom hand. Okay, well, I guess all of the panelists were so efficient that you answered any questions that people might have. So thanks again to our panelists. Um, and I see that we might end a bit early. So thank you again to all of our panelists for being here to share information with the group. And my heartfelt thanks to all of you. Before Francesca concludes this event, I'd like to express my personal appreciation on behalf of the Book to Action Steering Committee to Francesca for her leadership of this program. So Francesca, Elaine, JT, Leslie, and I, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And I'll turn it over to Francesca to conclude and wrap up. I think she has some resources to share with everybody. Francesca, you're up. Thank you so much, uh, Laurel. And thank you for your leadership today and facilitating today's program. Thank you so much to the Book to Action Steering Committee. Um, a big really shout out to Elaine and JT, who when we sought to have a book selection, they both really encouraged cast so we can thank them also for us having this book. Um, we also want to thank, of course, the Community Foundation and the California Center for the Book. We thank all of the amazing organizations today. Thank you so much, Stephen, Rosemary, Feroz, JT, Kathy, Elaine, who shared your amazing resources. A reminder that CAST is available for checkout at the library. We also have digital copies that you can check out for free, either audio or ebook to your smartphone, iPad, Kindle, computer, or other device. This is through the Northern California Digital Library with your Monterey Public Car Library card. And Monterey Public Library cards are free for anyone who lives in California. Another note is that the Monterey Public Library will have a book club bag of cast with 10 copies that will be available to borrow in case you or you know anyone who might want to have a book club. And we do invite you to tomorrow's final book discussion. It takes place at 11 a.m. And then finally, um, next week on Thursday, July 29th, Laverne McLeod, who is a local author and educator, will lead a workshop as the closing book to action program. Thank you so much to everyone who is joining today, to all of the panelists, all of the members and the book discussion leaders. It was such a rich time. And I have to say, I'm sad that it's coming to a conclusion, even though I know our work is never coming to a conclusion, there's always more to do and we will keep doing that. If there are any final questions for the panelists or anyone else, of course, there is still the remaining time. Thank you again, Laurel and everyone here. All. If anyone has questions, please raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, thanks for being here and we're ending a bit early. Uh, I, I'd like to just say, uh, I just want to, um, well, thank you everyone, but I want to particularly call out for Rose, uh, who I think is, if I heard this correctly, is pretty brand new to NCBI. And, and, I, and yeah, I'm involved with the organization as well. And I thought you did a fabulous job. So I just wanted to um, I brush that for that. Yeah. Very nice. JT, do you want to sing a song? <laughs> okay.
Okay. She says no. <laughs> All I right. Like you, JT. That would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sorry, JT. <laughs> she's 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 not performing. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Again, really appreciate your time. Thank you to the panelists. Oh, uh, take care. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.